happy to be here for our annual Christmas Woo! service. And uh, uh, man, you know, I, I got into the holiday spirit. You know, I got, I'm in my study here. We got my uh, uh, Christmas tree, got the fireplace cooking in the back. And uh, uh, we're getting nice and cozy here as we get into God's word. Now, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us have been talking about uh, Christmas music. We've been hearing some Christmas music here this morning. But one of the most famous Christmas songs is Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Now, I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to sing it. I, I got a little bit of a stuffy nose. Otherwise, sing I would it. totally sing it because, you know, that is a gift I have given to me from God is my singing ability. But the song goes like this. You better watch out. You better not cry. Better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list and checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. It's kind of creepy. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good, for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. And this morning, I, I don't want to talk about Santa Claus coming to town, which if you read the lyrics of the song, it's pretty hard to lie. It tells us, man, he sees you, your every waking breath. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. And he's coming to town. But, but we don't want to talk about Santa this morning. We want to talk about Jesus Christ coming to town. That's the title of my lesson. Jesus Christ is coming to town. And there's a there's scripture that wow. even talk about it. Let's go here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go, bro. First Thessalonians chapter four. And it says here in chapter four, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And, you know, in the same way it talked, we, we hear about Santa Claus. He, he comes in the night when, when, when you're not expecting him. In a very real, dare I say, an even more real way, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night, the Bible says. And he's going to come when we least expect it. And the one question he has is, have you been naughty or have you been nice? You know, there's two guarantees that I have for you this morning. One is that Santa... It is not coming to town this year, right? He's not coming to town. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pandemic. There's been a lot going on. Santa's not coming to town, but you know, a guarantee I do have for you as well. Jesus Christ is coming to town. My first point, he's making a list. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go, Christian. Hebrews chapter 12. Get it. Come on, bro. Let's get it. And we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, the Bible reads, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. Because they could not bear what was commanded. Even an angel, even if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, 
to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. And, you know, you know, here that the Bible tells us that those who are in the church, those who, who are in the body, who've been baptized into the body of Christ in a very real way. Your name is on Jesus's nice list. You know, your, your name is on Jesus's nice list. But the, the reality of it, it's not just it, it doesn't end there. It doesn't end after your name gets written down, right? Let's let's turn here to Revelation chapter 20. Take us there, bro. Let's go. And in Revelation chapter 20 is the, the, one of the last scriptures here in the Bible. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Reads, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them and i saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were opened another book was opened which is the book of life you know you know even more important than santa's naughty and nice list who's getting presents who's getting cool is jesus's Naughty and nice list. And here he opens it up. But he doesn't call it the naughty and nice list. He calls it the book of life. And that there's really no naughty list. It's the nice list. And it ends there. It continues. The dead were judged according to what they had done. As recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. You know, the, the, the awesome thing is, is that once we come into the body of Christ, you know, and if you're visiting with us, we want to encourage you to study the Bible. You know, make sure that, that you are on Jesus's nice list. The only way we can be sure is by studying the Bible. Amen. Now, now to take it a step further. Once our, our name is written in the book of life, then the Bible says that the books of our life are opened. You know, it, it's one of those, like, if, 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 if the book of life is digitalized by the time we get there, right, it'll look, it'll look something like this. It's when you click on the tab, but then there's more tabs underneath. Right. And you know what? The awesome thing is, is that you're if you're a baptized disciple of Jesus, you have a tab in the book of life. Now, what, what Jesus is going to do when, when, we, when he comes to check out that nice list is what he's going to do. He's going to double click. He's going to double click. And he, he's going to look in. He's going to look on, uh, on Ray Fernando's book. And, you know, he, he's going to see Ray's, Ray's incredible musical escapades and, and his incredible uh, abilities and all the degrees he has. This guy has more degrees than I have years of life, just about. And, you know, he, he's going to see all the incredible things. But along with all the, the incredible things that, that Ray has done, he's going to have to answer for the stuff that, that he may have not been so proud about. And in the same way, he's going to open up the book of life of King Hua, you know, the incredible royal priesthood Bible talk leader who, who him and his team earned an incredible dinner uh, that may, may happen by the end of the year. It may not. It may have to wait until January. But he, he's going to see, man, this guy, this guy baptized Oscar Castillo. And he, he's going to click on that chapter. But then he's going to click on chapter two. And chapter three and chapter four and five and six and seven as well. And it's something that we have to understand as disciples is that is as awesome as it is that we get a tab in the book of life. Our, our salvation is dependent on what we write 
in the books of our life in the weeks and months and years to follow. You know, uh, before 2020 started, there was, there, was a, uh, uh, there was a thing getting blown out there that 2020 was going to be the year of gratitude. The year of gratitude. I was just reading it up on it this morning. That 2020 was supposed to be the year of gratitude. And when you have it in the year of the year of gratitude, we have one of the most insane, diabolical, uh, uh, hateful, pandemic-ridden uh, uh, the, the year that has been the, the craziest year that just about every single one of us has seen. Yeah, I, I, I stand before you, uh, healthy, you know, healthy for for just about everybody's. Uh, 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 everybody's scale, and I believe that everybody on, on here um, it has some level of health. The fact that you could be on a call for a Sunday service on a, a December 20th and a uh, man of 2020 of this crazy year. And, and dare I say that each and every one of us has thousands, thousands, thousands of things to be grateful for. And I, I believe that being the year of gratitude, and I believe that every year that Jesus gives us here on this earth is to be a year of gratitude. You know, I read a, a quote earlier. It says, you know, so many people wake up from their alarm clock, and they think it's their alarm clock that woke them up. It wasn't your alarm clock that woke you up. It was Jesus. Jesus woke you up this morning. It wasn't your alarm clock going off at 730 that you may have snoozed five times. It, it, it wasn't, man, church is starting here in 30 minutes. I got to get dressed. That, that, that's not, church didn't get you up this morning. Your alarm didn't get you up this morning. Jesus Christ woke you up this morning. That is something to be grateful for. And I, I want to challenge all of us this morning that before the year is over, take some time, take a, take a, take a sheet of paper and write out a list uh, of things you're grateful for. You know, I believe there, there's 52 rows on, on a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper, or you could get the wide ruled um, and you, you could cheat a little bit and fill it up, write, write, write something on each row. You know, things, it, it could be family. It, it could be health. It, it, it could be, man, it could be your salvation. It could be, man, somebody you reach out to. For, for K, man, you say an Oscar baptized here with less than two weeks left of the year. How incredible is that? a new addition to the teen ministry. Man, I, I can promise you that Oscar is not going to have a, any difficulty filling out a gratitude list. Why? Because this guy is grateful for his salvation. You know, uh, another thing I want to call us to is Philippians chapter 4. Here in Philippians chapter 4. And here in Philippians chapter 4, in verse three, it says, yes, this is Paul writing. He says, yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have been contended, who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So here we see some more guys, who, who men and women who, whose names are written in the book of life. But look what else Paul said here. He said, he, he writes, he says, I ask you, yoke fellow. You know, yoke fellow, it's not a, a word we, we hear a lot uh, these days. But a yoke fellow is somebody who, who you're working side by side with. You know, a lot of us, we, we've seen the picture of the oxen and the yoke. And it's somebody who you're just working side by side with. And Paul writes here, he said, man, I, I'm so grateful for my, for my yoke fellow. And he also says, he says, I, I, I'm grateful for the women who have contended by my side. You know, contended, to contend means to struggle, to surmount. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a struggle, it's to overcome a difficulty. Right, synonyms of contend are to cope with, to face, to grapple with, to deal with, to take on. You know, I, I believe that to really assure 
that our, our, our names and our book our, our books of our life stay up to date with the, our, our name written in the book of life. I believe that that's what's truly going to help us stay solid, keep our, our, our names solidly written in there, not with that invisible ink, but with black Sharpie to make sure that our, our names stay solidified in the book of life. We need to get a yoke fellow. You know, we, we, we need to get a yoke, but we need to get somebody to con contend by our side. It's something that Paul understood. He, he writes not only about his one yoke fellow, he talks about the women as well. It wasn't his direct yoke fellow, but it was, it was his company. You know, I, I believe that this morning, if, if you're struggling, I, I believe a big reason for it is because of your isolation. You know, when, when we start to go down the Christian walk, and we, we lose that one another mentality. You know, we, we, we lose that, that yoke fellow spirits. And we, we, we just go day by day, grind after grind after grind. You know, the, the reality is, is that we, we may be able to deceive ourselves. You know, you may be strong. You may be independent. You may even have your, your life in order from a worldly perspective. But God is very adamant, man, we need to, Matthew 6, we need to seek first the kingdom. We need to seek first a yoke fellow. You know, it's so awesome just yesterday to see Oscar Newton out, uh, looked, I looked like it was over there on Sac State, um, and, uh, uh, and, and just, just praying and just crying out to God. And I was like, man, you know, Oscar's solid. That this guy didn't get baptized and then go back and just isolate himself. He's over at the brother's household. He's spending time with the brothers. Why? Because he understands, man, I can't do this alone. I need a yoke fellow. And it's so awesome to see him and Newton, two in the teen ministry, be yoked in doing the will of God. I want to challenge all of us. Get a yoke fellow. You know, I, I think part of understanding of the importance of the yoke fellow is understanding the purpose of Christianity. You know, you see, 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 Christianity, the majority of the world sees Christianity as one thing. The majority of the world sees Christianity of a lot of things not to do. You know, don't, don't drink too much. Don't smoke. You know, don't be, don't be immoral. Don't be impure. You know, you know don't, don't, don't cuss. And don't, 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 don't. In reality, Christianity is nothing about don't do this. Right? That, that's, that's not what Christianity is about. Yeah, God wants us to stay away from things that are going to hurt us. But true Christianity is about the greatest purpose anybody could imagine. It's a, it's a life completely devoted to changing the world by freeing the prisoners, as we heard James share. It's about spending your, your short period of time on this earth, your, your short period of time, preaching the, the, the one thing that matters. You know, it, it's, it's about making disciples and it's about as it says in Luke and as James, James shared, it's about seeking and saving the lost. My second point is who's been naughty and who's been nice. You know, that this is quite literally how Jesus sees the world. You know, there's, there's, there's dozens of scripture. There's dozens of scripture that back it up. It's either you're either in or you're out. As Jesus says, you're either with me or you're against me. It's, it's light and it's darkness. It's building up the kingdom, gathering disciples or tearing it down by inactivity. You know, this, this is a concept that, that, that the world hates. That this black and white this naughty and nice right and wrong attitude. This, this is something that the world that, that does not tolerate. You know, there was a billboard in San Francisco years back, and it said with an exclamation point, intolerance with intolerance. 
intolerant with, with, with intolerance. What it's saying is like, man, it, we're, we're tired of people putting restrictions on how to live. We just need to open the floodgates and let everything be okay. Stop, stop saying you can't do this and you can't do this. And the world tells us that exact statement. Stop judging. You know, and, and it's something that as we go on, it can sound kind of nice. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 warns us. See that no one takes you captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies, which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world. Basic principles. Don't be basic, guys. Don't be basic. Don't, don't fall into the trap of the world that says, hey, you know what? If And I, I, I got to be honest, guys. Before I became an assumption, this is something that I fell into as well. You know, I, I, I had a, a, a very, I won't say deep, I had very light convictions, you know, on what it meant to be, in God's eyes, naughty or nice, right? To go to heaven or to not go to heaven. I, I decided, it's like, you know, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to go to heaven. But then I, I, I got to San Francisco State, right? I got to San Francisco State, and my eyes opened up. I, I, I started to get friend, make friends who were Muslim. I started to make friends who, who were atheists. You know, I, I started to build these relationships. You know, people who, who struggle with, with same-sex attraction. You know, and people in the LBGTQ community, I, I began to build relationships with these people. And, and my convictions and my stance of only these people go to heaven. Only those who fear God became to, 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 to minimize a little bit. Because I said, man, these people are such nice people. You know, these, these people mean so, these people mean well. You know, but, but, but what, what had happened is, is I had lost my idealism. Why did I lose it? It was because as I, as I started to go through, go through life, I, I started to realize that the foundation that I thought that I had was actually no foundation at all. Let's look at it. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Let's go, bro. Matthew chapter 7, we see Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sands. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, my, my brothers and sisters, and this is for those in the church, and this is for, the, for those visiting, right? And then when we don't get our convictions, not only from the Bible, but if we don't go after living out our convictions, as it says here in verse 24, he says, those who hear the, my, the words of mine and put them into practice are like wise men and women who build their house on the rock. See that when we when we stop not only reading, which is going to erode our relationship with God in itself, but stop putting into practice what we're reading. Not only will our, our, will our convictions start to erode, will we start stop living out the will of our life, but we will we will we'll start to get fuzzy uh, on what that foundation really is. That's why, why Paul writes in Colossians 2. He, he's not writing it just because. He's saying, man, see to it. Man, man, be, pay careful attention that nobody, as he says, takes you captive 
by hollow and deceptive philosophies, right? When, when we don't stay rooted in God, when, when we don't stay close to God in our quiet times, when we don't stay close to God through getting our yoke fellows by going out, sharing our faith, getting into Bible studies, the pull of the world, of the hollow, deceptive philosophies that once when you were close to God seemed so foolish. You all, you could almost laugh at them. And the, the, the immorality that used to be so, pull you so hard. The impurity, the drunkenness that used to be such a draw, you could almost laugh at the distance you are from it. Yet before you know it, you, you can find yourself wrestling with those same hollow and deceptive philosophies you were once far away from those months or years ago. You know, we, we got to make a decision that we're going to be nice, that we're going to be on the nice list, that we're going to stay away from the naughty list of worldliness. You know, let's keep it going here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. With you, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. Christian, come on, bro. Thank you, Christian. Let's go, yeah. Christian. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible reads, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. You, you spent long enough on the naughty list. It says, in this futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more you however did not come to know christ that way see what you gotta understand it is in the world there's a continual lust for more you always want more there's never enough pornography there's never enough alcohol that there's never enough laziness that there's never enough video games whenever you get a taste you're gonna want more and then once you get that once you get a little more you're gonna want more you're gonna want more you're gonna want more and it never ends it keeps going and going and going that that's why i so love how paul says here in verse 20 He's writing to these people. He says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Why? Because the, 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 as, as Colossians says, it says the, the, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, the, the, the idea that we would wake up on a Sunday morning and, and sing to God and read our sheet music and open the Zoom chat to read the lyrics and we would be praising God and you'd be listening to a guy preach with a fake Christmas tree behind him and you, you would, be, you would be, 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 be giving your heart and fired up to God. The world says, what are you doing? Man, it's, it's football Sunday. It, it, it's a big day, man. You could be hanging out with the girl. You could be going to get some brunch with some, some friends. You could be fellowshipping with your family. It's the holiday season. But Paul says, he, he says, he, says you know, he understands, you know, as disciples, we don't live the way the world does. But how, how important is it? It's more important now than ever in the holiday season that we take a stand for righteousness. You know, the, the more, the closer to the world you get, the more stupid you become, right? It's just the, 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 the further away from God you get, you just start doing stupid stuff, you know? And for those of us who, and I believe all of us have at one point gotten weak in our faith, and then you get strong again, you look back down and you think, what was I thinking? What, what, what was what was I thinking back? I, I was 
I was so temperamental. I, I was, I, I was, I was so lustful. I was so, man, what was I thinking? But when we drift from God, that's what happens. Jump down here to verse 29, chapter four, Ephesians chapter four, verse 29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, as it says here, don't give yourself over to the anger. Don't give yourself over to the bitterness that may come in your heart around the holidays. So-and-so forgot you. Your, your families let you down. Don't give yourself over to that. Let's be imitators, as it says in chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God. Right? What did God do? He gave his only son. You know, it's so awesome that we celebrate Christmas, celebrating the, the birth of Jesus. But 33 years later, God sacrificed his one and only. Let us be those that this holiday season who sacrifice. You know, what does sacrifice mean? It means let go of something you don't want to let go of. That's really what it means to sacrifice. You know, it's not a sacrifice that you want to give something away or you want to go do something. Let us be sacrificial lambs this holiday season let us lay our lives down for a brother for a sister for, for somebody studying the bible go out of your way to do something great for somebody because that's truly the christmas spirit let's our, go to our third and final point which is he's coming to town come on he's bro. coming to town you know, there's over let's go bro hundred prophecies in the Bible, there's only one that hasn't been fulfilled. And that's that Jesus Christ would come to town. You know, let's, let's go to here to John chapter 14. Come on, bro. John chapter 14. And we see here in John chapter 14, <clears throat> Verse 1 says, do, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were, if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. You know, it's so awesome that here in John 14, Jesus says, hey, I'm, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. But I, I'm going to come back. I, I'm going to come back and... He said, you, you know the way. You know the way. What's the way? It's the way of true discipleship. It's the way of, as it says in John 12, making the Bible our standard. You know, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. You know, along with the, the list of gratitude, you know, I talked about making a gratitude list. I believe it's equally as important for us to do by the end of the year 
is to make a sin list. Make a sin list and look at what God has forgiven you of. And as much as it'd be awesome things to be grateful for, how about the, the, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? That even no matter where you've been at in 2020, that you can look back and look at what you've done and crumple it up and move on to green, the greener pastures that Jesus has for everybody on his nice list. And you know how awesome it is that God ha has, has room for every single person in the world on his nice list. The call for us is meant to get on the nice list, study the Bible, get into the family of God, get on to the nice list. But then understand it's one step is not going to get keep you there. We have to keep fighting every single day you know in titus chapter 2 verse 13 it says waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ you know all of christianity is based around the coming hope that is jesus christ and i, I believe that that all of you on this call are on here because you also believe in that hope. You also believe in that blessed hope, the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I want to close out with a, uh, a kingdom-friendly rendition of Santa Claus is coming to town. It goes something like this, and we're going to close out here. Let's go. Oh, you better get saved. You better not wait. You better make sure before it's too late. Jesus Christ is coming to town. He sees you when you're sinning. He knows when you repent. He loves you when you're bad or good. But be good for Jesus' sake. Jesus Christ is coming to town. He's making a list in the book of life. That will be the, all the end to your trouble and strife. We counted the cost and we're saving the lost because Jesus Christ is coming to town. I love you guys. Let's go. Lord. Let's do it. Yeah.